The incredible story about to unfold, I believe, is due in great measure to a praying grandmother who lived to 109. My guest is Aileen Johnston, and she is from Carrick Fergus, just about 12 minutes outside Belfast in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And you have provided me with a page-turning mini-series <laughs> that we have to try and tell in just a few minutes. But it is wonderful to see you, knowing your story, just looking so fresh and alive, and you truly are a survivor, Aileen. Amen. And that's not because you're one of six children, <laughs> as I am. Um, I want to go right to that little church that your grandparents cleaned and you visited because uh, you were sent to church as a child. I was, and I used to go down and stay with my grandmother at the summertime and used to love to go to the church with her. And it was an old Presbyterian church and right up to the pulpit there was this brass railing. And so she gave me the job of cleaning the brass and I would get up and I would stand in the front and stand in this pulpit and pretend that I was preaching to everybody there. That so, is so precious because you do now preach all over the world. I have preached in a good few places. Many places. <sighs> Not an easy home to grow up in. Dad was gone most of the time. He worked away quite a bit to, to make the money to help us survive when six children, as you know yourself, it takes a lot of money to provide everything that's needed. So mum was left on her own with us all and I think that was a strain, but I only realise that now. You know. When we become adults and parents ourselves, we have a lot more identification with their struggles. We do. We? Mm -hmm. You would struggle, kind of a withdrawn child. You left school at 17. Mm -hmm. I, I think I got to the stage, I was very quiet and would have faded into the background, but I was inside, I was determined, no, you know, I want to live my life and nobody's going to tell me what to do or what not to do. And so off I went. And so you really didn't take to heart the concern of friends about that boyfriend. No, I didn't. And actually one of my friends was his cousin. Mm -hmm. And she had said to me, you know, you need to be careful with him. He's a bit of a Casanova, you know. I don't really think you should be with him. I was quite sheltered, but I was drawn into his life, his stories, which I later found out weren't really true stories, but, mm -hmm. and he was a good looking guy. Mm -hmm. so. Married at 19. Mm -hmm. One good thing this relationship provided, and that was your first significant connection to Jesus. Yes, that's right. My, my first wedding anniversary, my husband and my brother were in a motorbike accident. And, uh, it, it was quite a serious one and we were told at the time, you know, the next 72 hours are very crucial. And my husband's boss actually used to come every day and take me up to the hospital because it was quite a bit away and I couldn't drive. And he came every day and his wife and they would have maybe made a meal for me and given it to me. And I used to think, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Until one day I just asked him, and straight away he was able to tell me the gospel, even though I'd been at church and so I knew about Jesus and I knew you needed to be saved and born again. But just seeing it in action, seeing mm. somebody show the love of God without, you know, ramming it down my throat. He just mm. showed me, this is what you do whenever the love of God is in you. You be there for other people, you help other people. What an and important message for all of us yes. to hear. <laughs> How quickly after all this you would try to kill yourself? That probably happened maybe two or three years. My first daughter was two years old when it happened and things had just got so bad in the marriage and people had sort of said to me, my husband was seeing other women and you don't want to believe it. You get married and you make these vows before God and you believe that's for life. Um, but unfortunately he was interested in other women and it was on, actually on Christmas Eve um, and you're running around preparing for Christmas and he didn't arrive home and he didn't arrive for Christmas. Devastating. And then I sort of believed yeah it's true what everybody's saying mm -hmm. and it was he was with his girlfriend and wanted to spend Christmas with her. 
it's easy to conclude that God could have done differently, prevented this, and I know you wrestled with all that, and you turned your back on God. I did. I did. To my shame now when I think about it, but I just believed, God, you are sovereign, you are powerful. I'm here, I've become a Christian, I've given my life to you. Why are you not stopping all this happening? And I, I deliberately and very determinedly said, well, that's it. If you're not going to do that for me, I'm off. A scripture comes to mind. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful. And Amen. we're going to hear how God picked you up in this abandoning of him. Mm -hmm. Right after this, please stay with us. 